Okay, I'd love to just go ahead and start off and welcome everybody to the Doggy Zone Ask the Trainer live call here. Uh, we are constantly improving our format here as the past three weeks. We are getting lots of great feedback from you all. So uh, thank you all who've been sending feedback to me. It's been super, super helpful. Um, we're going to go ahead and we are going to mute everybody out on the call. Um, at this point in time, just so that we can keep our auto, audio quality good. This call is being recorded for those who are unable to make the call, so you'll be able to refer back to this at a later time. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with using Zoom, uh, this program that we're using, Ring Central Meetings, operates the exact same way that Zoom does. So if you're familiar with Zoom, just use what you've normally used in the past. Uh, there is a chat bar feature. Um, if you're on a mobile device, you'll have to go down to the bottom of your page and hit participants in order to be able to get to that chat bar. Um, and we'd love for you to do that because we're going to ask for some engagement from you all as we go through the call here today. And I'd love to just make sure that all of you know how to use that chat bar feature. Um, so if we could just go ahead and start everybody off by giving us a one word check in on uh, something funny that your dog did today. Uh, just one word to describe something funny that your dog did today. So go ahead and drop that into the chat bar here and let's see what kind of crazy responses we have here. Hopped, I hope not a fence. Zoom, uh, interesting. I'm, I'm kind of curious if your dog was using Zoom or if your dog was Zooming. Um, but it looks like we have two people using the chat bar here. Uh, crawled, jumped, swam. All right. Sounds like uh, some active dogs. So we know that active dogs mean better behaved dogs, right? Um, so that's great. Zoomies, swam, smiled, run. Awesome. Awesome. So as we go through the call here, um, we'd love for you all to go ahead and provide, you know, live feedback to us if we're uh, answering a question and your dog has experienced something similar or you're experiencing something similar. Um, go ahead and put that into the chat bar. Um, we will go ahead and do our best to answer those relevant questions alongside the questions that have been sent in prior to the call. Um, if you have a question that pops up that's completely unrelated, feel free to go ahead and throw it into the chat. <laughs> We're going to answer it, uh, but we will do our best to. And um, I'm going to do my best not to crack up right now. Um, so anyways, um, please uh, put those questions into uh, the chat bar as they come to mind for you. Please do not wait. Um, what I'd like to do real quick is just a quick introduction um, of the two trainers that are going to be answering questions for us here this evening. We have two of our training experts with us. Uh, well, actually, we have a bunch of our training experts with us, but only two of them will be answering questions tonight, which is going to be Terrence and George. So, Terrence, could you just go ahead and give us a real quick introduction about yourself? Hi, I'm Terrence. I've been with Doggy Zone for a little over a year and a half now. I'm a former police canine trainer and combined training with law enforcement and civilian. I've been training for 32 years. Boom. Awesome. And uh, Terrence, you got a fun fact about you? I mean, that's a fun fact that you gave us, but. <laughs> that wasn't fun. Uh, during training, I have fell a lot. He's fallen a lot during training. Interesting. I have yet to witness this. I hope that I don't want to. <laughs> no, you don't want to. That's a, that's a long <laughs> fall. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you, Terrence. And George, if you could give us a real quick introduction. Earth to George. Let me unmute you. Uh, at Doggy Zone, I've uh, been with Andrew since Doggy Zone uh, was established. Uh, I'm 43 years in the business. Uh, fun fact about me. I once wrestled an alligator. Hmm. Wrestled an alligator. How about that? Awesome. Awesome. I'm sure that there's going to be some questions that come into the chat bar for that one. So we'll see if we have time after uh, we get through everything for that. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that were pre-submitted. Um, some of them uh, were from last week that we wanted to bring over to this week, but we're going to just go ahead and dive right in here. Um, so the first question that we uh, had gotten was really around barking and we had a, uh, and nipping. We had a few people uh, actually 
email similar types of questions regarding this. So um, what we have here is sometimes when I stop him chewing or doing other things that he is not supposed to do, he barks at me and nips me. How do I handle him when he does that? So we have a dog here that's um, barking at and nipping at the owner when the owner is trying to stop them from doing something he shouldn't be doing. Terrence, why don't you go ahead and start us off? All right. Um, so what I would do is, one, I would have some type of leash on him uh, to try to contain him or control him. Uh, I, I would redirect his behavior. I would have some chew toys available for him. I would have some treats available for him. Uh, in the beginning, just redirect him, and then after you get him redirected and you get his attention on you, I would, um, you know, start doing a little bit of obedience or something, you know, to do some obedience, and, and not a routine, but just some sit, good, treat, down, good, treat, come, take their mind off of what they're doing, and if it gets too excessive, um, put them in their crate, Put them in their crate for about five minutes, come back, let them have their freedom, then come back again, let them out, then try again, 10 minutes. And just slowly increase the, the time uh, because dogs don't like their freedom taken away from them. Excellent. And uh, George, if you want to, um, if you can add, go ahead and add on to that. Sure, I'd agree with everything that uh, Terrence uh, said. Remember, the puppy's always trying to get what he wants and what he needs all the time. And uh, if you give in to those little outbursts and he finds that works for him, he's inclined to repeat it. So I would be a big fan of redirecting him into something else since he's being so energetic and wants uh, interaction. Uh, if he's getting real rude about it, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to pack him off to his crate for a little downtime. Um, you know, it's, he's just testing the waters, I'm sure. He's just, you know, you're trying to make him stop something he wants to do, and uh, he's giving you the business there. So, uh, you know, don't let him push you around too much. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to just add a little piece to this just because I think it's relevant. And um, based on the question here, I think that uh, it's important for us to really uh, just talk briefly about why this is happening um, if you have a dog that when you're trying to interrupt them or stop them from doing something and they're barking at you or maybe nipping at you, um, it's clear that there is a leadership issue in place. Um, the dog is certainly perceiving that they are in control and that ultimately they don't want you doing what it is that you're doing. Whatever you're probably doing is considered nagging to them. So you may be trying to stop them by you know, putting your hand on them or whatever the case may be that is perceived by the dog as nagging. And so they are at the point where they're beginning to communicate to you that they don't like what's happening. They don't like the fact that you're trying to interrupt them in that situation. So leadership is the big piece there. Um, without spending too much time on this, at the end of the day, the most important thing for you at this point is gonna be to deliver obedience with that dog as much as you possibly can, because a dog cannot be obedient and chewing things or doing things that they're not supposed to be if they're following commands that have been given to them and they've got a job to be doing. This clearly sounds like a dog to me that doesn't have a job and needs some direction. We're going to go ahead and dive into the next thing here, Sophia with Harley. How do you build engagement? Um, tips for desensitizing or desensitization towards a cat. So I'm guessing here that we have a dog that um, has a hard time keeping engaged with the owner in the presence of cats. So uh, Terrence, would you, um, would you mind kind of sharing with us, you know, you, you've obviously with working dogs, you've, um, you've dealt with some, some very high drive dogs. Um, how is it that you um, would desensitize um, a dog that's got a lot of drive towards a cat? Um, great question. I've actually uh, went to a cat adoption place, brought the dogs in uh, to the location, but I had them behind fence and the cats couldn't jump over the fence. So I start from afar. Um, I start like way back and I have the guys in, you know, engage with their dogs. I have them play, just play. Don't even do an obedience. Just play, play, play. And as they're playing, I have them slowly move a little closer. Uh, then when the dogs get to the point where they're realizing that the cats are in their presence now and they can see them, they see them moving around, then I have them start doing obedience. And that play we just did, 
comes back into play as a reward. So they'll say, sit, good, and then they'll start play, 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 play. Um, so basically, it just starts out from afar and then work its way in. Uh, the biggest thing is just to, you know, have your dog's attention. And it's easy to get your dog's attention just by playing with them, playing with them. And then when they stop wanting to play, you know, move in a different direction, move to a different location and play again. Awesome. That's great. George. Well, uh, anybody that's ever tried to control a cat knows that that can be a tough thing. And if you can't control the, um, the distraction level, so if the dog's past that point where he just can't think anymore, you get, you're going to have to remove the cat further away or get the dog further away first. Um, if that dog's totally bombing that cat, you're not, he's not hearing you. He's not, uh, he's not listening or looking to you or anything like that. So you want to control that training situation as best you can. I would maybe keep the dog on the other side of some type of barrier, like Terrence said, and work his obedience. Uh, but there's a certain point, a certain distance, if you will, where you're going to lose that dog and they go over into that red zone. That's not a good training scenario. So if you're trying to train it for future use, I'm going to back away and keep the dog below threshold and get his obedience right. And I would do it often. You know, uh, familiarity is going to bring some boredom about it. So if the cat just comes out once a week, hey, you know, it's going to always be novel and kind of a turn on. But if he sees the cat all the time while he's being made to do some simple obedience, things like that, that's going to lose some of its, uh, its uh, wow factor. So again, controlling your training scenario is key to that. Uh, just, you know, you're trying to do the dog and the cat just pops into the room, you know, you're going to lose them there. So plan ahead. Cat in a cage would work too, you know, to help. Say that again. You said a cat in a cage? Yeah, like mm -hmm. put the cat in like a car, you know, a cat carrier or a dog, you know, dog crate. So the cat is controlled. The biggest part there is controlling the cat. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because, you know, a lot of the times what happens is you end up uh, trying to take the dog around the cat. The cat takes off, puts the dog in a prey drive and makes it very difficult to actually get the dog to settle when the cat's always taking off and putting them into prey. So awesome. Okay, we're going to dive into the next thing here, Matt, with Millie. What are some methods that set your dog up to succeed when introducing a new skill? examples please so it sounds to me like um we want to teach our dog something new um and when we teach them something new we want to set them up for success so um terrence what are some ways that we can help a dog for success when we're teaching a new skill to them if you have any examples always have them on a leash <laughs> you want to have some control over the uh the situation that you're doing and you want to set them up to win and not ignore you uh, basically, the leash, the leash is your best friend. Uh, to promote any off-leash or any new skill, you want to be able to guide and redirect them in, in, in all cases. And an example I would use is, say, come for instance. Say you are, your dog is in the backyard, and he's at the back of the yard, and you want to say, you know what, we've been practicing come. Let me just try come. Or let's just say you've never done come. So you do the come, and he doesn't come. Now you fail. Then you say, come again, you failed again. Come again, you failed again. So therefore, to make this very successful, have him on leash, come. He probably won't come, but you're gonna guide him to you and then have a reward, whether it's food, a toy, or tactile stimulation, which is physical touch. Praise him up, throw him a party. So Terrence, what I'm hearing from you there is um, pretty much don't give a command unless you can actually enforce what it is that you're saying to the dog. Is that correct? Wow, that's amazing, Andrew, because that is one of my sayings that mostly everyone in news do. Don't ever <laughs> give a command that you're not prepared to reinforce. Yep. And hence the reason why I have a come and a let's go command, because there are some situations that I kind of know that I'm just not in a position <laughs> to make sure that I succeed. So I use that let's go. George, why don't you go ahead and uh, add on to that if you'd like. 
Well, uh, everything you've said is is I uh, completely agree with. Uh, one of the things I'm a big one on, especially early training of the dog, is controlling the training environment at first. Um, you know, just making sure that the the bombs that we get, the unintended distractions, that don't train in an area where there's going to be 20 dogs coming by and distracting the dog, things like that. And yeah, uh, your equipment's important. I'm never going to say come to a new dog or a fresh dog or a green dog unless I have a length of rope on them so I can show them the correct response every single time until they get it. Awesome. Excellent. Next question that we had gotten here was um, from Ed with Gigi. How do you refine a reliable fetch? Um, so this is a, um, an interesting question. And um, we were talking about, me and Jessica were talking about this the other day of, you know, how are we going to, to answer this? And so um, I'm going to have uh, George and Terrence go ahead and answer the question here in a second. Okay. Take a, a moment to just really create some clarity about what a reliable fetch is. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, mindsets and beliefs in the training world about how to teach dogs to retrieve. Um, me, myself personally, I have learned um, more or less two different types of retrieves. Uh, one is more of what we would consider a play style retrieve, um, which is not a requirement. It is meant to be completely a fun experience. And then we have what's called a forced soft mouth retrieval. And a forced soft mouth retrieval is what's used um, when training hunting dogs, also a lot of the time when training service dogs to you know, pick up things, that they must do it on command, that there's not a question of if they can, if they're allowed to you know, do it, they have to. You know, if we tell the dog, to hit the light switch, then they have to do it um, with a service dog. So you have two different types of retrieves here. And um, I think that, you know, what we'll do here is we're going to focus our answering this question um, around more of a play retrieve. And the main reason why is because forced soft mouth retrieval is a very extensive training process that we don't really think is um, the best thing for clients to be teaching to their dog unless they have a real reason for it. Um, done improperly, it can damage your relationship with your dog. Uh, we want to help you guys improve your relationship with your dog, and most of you don't necessarily need a forced retrieve uh, to go get the newspaper and turn on light switches and open doors and things of that nature. So if um, Terrence, as you go through, and George, as you go through, if you guys want to kind of uh, answer this from a how do we just take that play time of playing fetch with the dog and make it more reliable so that the dog um, brings that back to, to us and, um, you know, lasts a little bit longer? Um, you made a great point, uh, Andrew. You know, the, the key word to hear to this is fun, play. Uh, if the dog won't even take whatever it is, let's just say some glove and he won't even take it out your hand, he's definitely not going to retrieve it. But you can make that toy, whatever it is, come alive. Uh, all of the questions are based around basically having a leash on your dog uh, because you don't want him to self-satisfy himself by taking it and then run it off. You want to be able to bring him back. That's the retrieve part. Make it really, really short. You know, so first, you, step one is you take it, have him take it out of your hand. You say, good, you mark it. I would do that a few times. And then after you do it, then I would actually take it out of hand, get it back from him, then toss it maybe one or two feet. Do it in increments. And when you do it in increments, you can start going to, you'll go from a six-foot line to a 10-foot ten ten line to a 20-foot to the point where the dog is retrieving. But every time he's coming back to you, you're going to praise him as if you're praising the command, come. Good. And you make a big deal out of it. And biggest thing, engage. Engage, have fun. Try not to put any negatives in there and stress. Awesome. George. Yeah. Well, you know me, I got a lot to say about retrieve work, but um, one thing to always remember, not every dog is a natural retriever. And um, while every dog can be taught to retrieve, in my opinion, but uh, for the play stuff, 
Let me tell you, avoiding mistakes in your initial training to me is also just as important as teaching exactly what Terrence said, you know, getting them to take that thing. Common mistake is people will throw something for the dog and then, you know, kind of stand there and wait and nothing happens and they go and pick it up and pretty soon the dog's training them to retrieve. So, uh, you know, I call it getting Jethro. There's a long story why we call it that. But anyway, the, the, the dog needs to learn to take it first and then pick it up, then reach out for it, then go get it. And if you're doing that in play, it's not that hard with a dog like Gigi, for instance, uh, who's a Labrador. And they, they usually just get them excited, get them grabbing at that thing you use. I usually use something very soft, you know a rag or something, get them to grab it. And when I'm, when they're grabbing that actual grab, I'll sit there and say, fetch, uh, you know, and get that game going. And then every once in a while I'll drop it and say, fetch, and they'll forget themselves and pick it up. And I'm going to praise. Another thing people do to make mistakes is they, every time the dog picks something up is they take it from them. Let that dog have the praise, the prize for a while. Let that dog be proud of it, laugh. And then let the dog offer it up to you. Just taking it away every time they grab it. Um, why would they bring it back to you? And you're going to take their stuff. So that's something to look at too. Uh, retrieve works are very complicated things sometimes, and it really should be demonstrated. Uh, you know, uh, but uh, just talking to it here, I would say that uh, you know, let the dog naturally start getting their favorite toy and just naming that, marking it, paying for it, and re rinse and repeat. Excellent. And I had a question that came directly to me. Um, about um, spending too much time doing retrieving. Um, she has a 25 pound dog um, and he keeps going and going and going. And so I think I'll, I'll just take a second to answer this here. So, um, you know, when it comes to retrieving, um, if you have a dog that's a very highly driven dog, I will tell you that you need to be careful with your dog. Um, I mean, last was it last week or the, the week before, um, we were playing uh, fetch with my labs out in the front yard and we just moved back to an area where we got lots of space and we're up on a hill and I'm retrieving with the, the or my wife was doing some retrieving with the dogs and I had just came back and I was like, hey, like I would probably stop with them now because some dogs don't know when to quit and you can retrieve with them to the point that they go into heat exhaustion and that you can have all sorts of major issues. Um, so there is a point where you, you do need to, um, you know, call it quits. Um, what I usually tell people is when you're teaching a dog to retrieve your retrieving sessions, you should probably be tracking them in some form or fashion. Um, you know, if you have, um, a dog that's not in great condition, meaning that they're getting a ton of exercise, going out and doing 50 retrieves with them is too much. Go out and do 10 retrieves. Go do 10 retrieves every day and do 10 really good retrieves with them. Go out, throw the ball. At 10 retrieves, the dog is having a blast and they're at their peak excitement. Great end the session right now. Yes, I could probably get another five or 10 retrieves out of that dog. But what I'm breaking is two things. One, I'm pushing the dog past their threshold where their excitement is going to start to go down as the session continues, which is going to cause them to have less interest in wanting to chase that toy. And plus, I also risk um, overdoing it with my dog, if you will. So um, I hope that answers uh, your question, Mildred. Uh, if it doesn't, uh, please just add something back into uh, the chat bar. But I think that uh, we hit on pretty much everything for this. We could probably do a full session just on retrieving. Uh, and I'd probably have a lot of fun with that. But we'll, we'll save that for another time. So moving on here, um, Hal and a few other people. My dog seems to remember her training inside, but for walks outside, she is a mess. So this is a situation where a dog is not uh, generalizing um, and isn't responding the same way indoors as are outside in the real world. Terrence, what do you have for us? Um, that's great. Uh, it, it's something that I tell the classes all of the time. Uh, don't just use this class and that be it. Uh, practice in the environment that you want them to live in with you as far as walking, so go outside. And yes, it's gonna be a struggle in the beginning, but do it in increments. 
you know, walk a block or two, uh, do some about turns, do some left turn, do some right turn, uh, manage your leash properly, but have them in that environment. Give them great exposure in that environment. You want to reward them in that environment as well. So when they sit or they make a turn, start it up good. You walk one way, you turn the other way, good. Slowly start marking that behavior. The more you start marking that behavior in that environment, they're going to start realizing that, okay, I can do this out here as well. So practice in the environment that you want them to be good in. Excellent. George? Yeah. Um, a lot of times you'll find that if you're practicing inside, you walk through a threshold to go outside and then all your rules go away. And the reason that is, is because you're probably changing your expectations saying, okay, now I'm outside. Now she's going to mess up. You know, now she's more distracted. The neighborhood walk uh, is an uncontrollable gauntlet of distraction. Uh, very hard to control. I mentioned earlier about controlling that training scenario. Uh, before I'd walk my dog a few blocks down the street all the time, I would spend a lot of time back and forth in front of the house or better yet in the yard at first and then graduate to in front of the house and then graduate three doors up and so on. Uh, but the biggest thing I see is inside we have this very controlled environment and then outside, as soon as we walk out, we lose what we, what we expect of the dog. And that's where if your dog can't get off the front porch without pulling, I'm going to work on the front porch you know, until we get that porch squared away. And then we're going to go across the yard and then we're going to go to the street. Um, and the dog learns very quickly in order to get to that place they want to be so badly, which is after those distractions, they have to produce those things that we expect indoors, outdoors, daytime, nighttime. So uh, again, I like taking it one step at a time. First the porch, then the yard, then the street. Uh, and making sure your expectations of your commands. So sit still means sit. You can do the back and forth that uh, Terrence mentioned, of course, let's go this way, let's go that way. But that's what it is. We go outside and we start thinking they can't do it. So uh, that's not the case at all. It's just you're taking them too far into distraction. Excellent. Um, you know, I think that uh, the uh, some of you have heard of the Pareto principle before or the 80-20 rule. I think that, you know, a lot of the times we're spending 80% of our time inside and 20% of our time outside. And most of the training that's probably being done, especially if you've started training recently in the past few months, you've been training indoors. Um, so it's time to transition that, uh, that training outside and have 80% of the training take place outside and 20% inside. Let's go ahead and dive into the next thing here. Uh, we are at the 30 minute mark here and we are right on track moving into question number six. Suki avoids taking walks with uh, Tim, my husband, and is too clinging with me. How do we equalize her affections? Um, so it sounds to me like we have a dog that's more oriented towards one person uh, versus the other. And I don't know is, um, I, I'm really curious, if, Jocelyn, if you are on the call, I would love for you to just comment into the chat bar um, what type of dog it is. I'm, I'm curious if it's a herding dog. I don't know. I'm just curious. Uh, so Terrence, why don't you uh, go ahead and um, let us know what you think should happen here. Um, interesting question. Great question. Uh, basically, I would have Tim spend more time uh, with your dog. Uh, have him spend more time with him. Have him feed him. Have him take on more walks. Uh, Andrew just brought up the 80-20 rule. So you take the dog for a walk 20% of the time and have Tim do it 80% of the time. Now, that is really a lot. So if that's too much for you and you feel like you might be losing touch, let's just say 60-40. Tim does 60, you do 40. And while he's out on that walk, bond. The walk is an amazing bonding experience. It is probably one of the best experiences you can do with your dog. So walks, 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 have him spend more time and actually feed him. And also, one more thing, have him feed him by hand sometimes. That actually helps as well. Awesome. George. Yeah. Um First thing I'd look at would be for yeah, Tim, is it Tim, the husband, um, you know, how much he's engaging with the dog other than walks, you know, like around the house, who's feeding the dog, who's, who's watching TV with the dog, you know, that sort of thing. 
uh, we want to make sure we're not unconsciously feeding that neediness for mom too. You know, if, uh, you know, if Tim's a little more indifferent to the dog than mom is, the dog's naturally going to gravitate towards her. So interaction with the dog, as Terrence mentioned, very, very, very important. And um, it's not uncommon for a dog to favor one person a little more than another. Uh, what sometimes helps is the, our exercise that we teach, the sitting on the dog. Have Tim sit on the dog and watch, you know, when he's hanging out watching TV. Don't let the dog always be clingy on mom when mom's present. Mom, it wouldn't hurt to, uh, to kind of be a little more indifferent to the dog too. Like kind of, you know, ignore the dog a little more when Tim's around and see if the dog starts grav gravitating towards him. Thing is, we can't control what that dog loves. You know, we, that's not a, that's a, there's not a command we can give for that, but um, you can certainly change the relationships on how much is really going on there between Tim and the dog. That's great. Um, okay, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and move forwards here. Bear with me just one second. So we have a few people um, that asked this one here, which is all around the lines of how to keep your dog entertained while working from home. Uh, so I know that um, this should be, should be interesting. Terrence, you have a few Malinois uh, and you're spending a lot of time at home with your Malinois, um, which just to circle back really quickly on this last question, which is the reason why I mentioned herding breeds is there's some breeds that you're going to find are more one person breed, uh, where they will tend to orient themselves towards one person in the household. So just look at what breed of dog you have. I see that a lot with herding dogs. Uh, so Terrence, with your Malinois, um, like what are some of the things that you do to keep your dog entertained, busy, uh, under control? I think there's a few different ways that we could describe what this person might be looking for here. Yeah, absolutely. The breed definitely uh, comes into play. And I have dogs, three of them, that moves 100 miles an hour. So what I do is I let them wear themselves out. Um, I let them pack out. They play. I monitor the play a lot of times. I just don't let them be down in the basement by themselves or out in the backyard or up on the main level. Um, I'm always monitoring them, but I let them wear themselves out. Uh, and after they wear themselves out, then I bring them to another level or another area, and then they're calm. They're all the calm. They got it all out. They play. Um, and then I take all three of them on walks also, and then I bring them back together. And I let them kind of figure it out. Uh, basically, and I don't have any toys involved because I don't want any possession over a toy. Now, if you have one dog, um, that's a little different. I, I can't even, I, I'm not sure how to answer that because I don't have one dog anymore. So I'll let someone else answer that question. But for multiple dogs and just overall, I just let them tire themselves out. Yeah, we're all crazy. I think all of us own multiple, multiple dogs. You have four dogs, parents. I have three. Don't put another one on me. <laughs> oh, my bad. I have five. Sorry. I get confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we need to find a trainer with one one dog to answer this question. But anyways, George, what do you what do you got for? <laughs> well, first thing I would say is you it's not your job to necessarily entertain your own dog all the time when you're trying to do a job at home. One thing uh, to keep more control in the home when you got some bored dogs is routine. Um, I would certainly schedule myself uh, if I was working, you know, full time from home. I'd schedule uh, like dog would be in the crate for maybe an hour. I'd make a point to, to get the dog out, work the dog ten or fifteen minutes really intensely mentally, uh, and then let the dog hang out with me. You know, giving them their bones or their toys. Uh, one thing I would recommend highly against would be getting your dog a dog to, to entertain your other dog. First of all, if you get a dog for that reason, there's no guarantee they'll even like each other. And then you got a double problem. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if you want a second dog, that's fine. Just remember, it's kind of a crapshoot whether they'll ultimately really play together a lot. So I would say routine a lot of mental training, a lot of stuff that makes the dog stop and think. I'm a great fan of, you know, teaching them tricks and things. Mental fatigue breeds sleep. 
physical fatigue tends to breed less motion, but not necessarily less uh, mental uh, excitement, if you will. So if they're bored mentally, they're going to tend to get into stuff. That's awesome. And, you know, it's a lot of you that are on here are, you know, working really hard with your dogs or have been working really hard with your dogs. And, you know, right now is like, literally the best time to put your dog in boot camp. And when I say that, it's like you are home with your dog. The routine, if I had a new puppy right now, or if I had a dog that I was looking to train and really get them on point, at this point, I would bring them out. I would have them out with me for five minutes. I would train or I would play or they'd be on a bathroom break and then they'd be back in their crate for an hour. And then they'd come back out for five minutes and they would come out for five minute increments for a week. Every hour coming out for five minutes, back and forth, back and forth, lots and lots of short, successful training sessions where they're coming out, they're working, they're going back and resting. This starts to program the dog that whenever they're coming out of the crate, they're coming out for a reason. They're coming out to work, to focus, to be engaged, to do with you versus autopilot, act a fool in the house. Week two, go to 10 minutes out. Let them out every hour for 10 minutes. Train, work, play, do the things that you need to do with them, but have focus behind it and gradually increase that by five minutes each week. You'll be amazed in a month. Your dog is, entertaining the dog will become a non-question because your dog will be out and will be working following what it is that you've directed them to do because you've now given them a high level of guidance in terms of what you want from them. So let's go ahead and move on to the next question here, which is from Melissa. My puppy is starting to jump on us a lot more. It is really bad when she has to relieve herself. Uh, she gets a bad case of the zoomies. <laughs> we will be outside in her yard trying to get her to empty and she will be an absolute nut job tearing through the yard. She has recently started to use her personal fly ball box and jumping using us as her personal fly board fly ball box and jumping off of us while doing doggy parkour. Uh, when she is crazy, how do we get her to not jump off us without discouraging her from going to the bathroom? So pretty much this is a situation. It sounds like where um, mom or her dad is going out into the yard, trying to get the dog to eliminate. And then when they're out there, the dog is bouncing off the walls. So my guess is that we might be missing a couple of uh, procedures in place here to set that dog up for success. So Terrence, uh, what do you got for us? Uh, you're right, Andrew. Uh, that's a loaded question and a great question. Basically, have your dog on a leash. Have them on a leash or have them on a long line. Um, the perfect long line, I keep saying is that the 10 foot training line that dog is on sales is actually perfect for that. That way you can keep them from jumping on you. You can control the situation. One more thing I would add is to teach your dog how to use the bathroom on command. And by doing this, as your dog is using the bathroom, come up with a word, potty, just as they're using it. Potty, 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 potty. After that, when they finish, good. No more potty, but you just say good. And then you just walk them off. That gives them something to look forward to. But heck, come up with a routine. Your dog is in a routine now that when you take them out in the yard, they have the zoomies and they jump off you. So change the routine. Have some more control over it by having them on the leash. Be patient. That's awesome. I just threw into the chat bar here because you talked about teaching dogs to eliminate on command. Um, there's a book called Eliminate on Command for those of you that your dog doesn't eliminate on command and you want them to be really on point with that. Go get the book off of Amazon. Read it and do it. It works. It's great. Um, George, what else would you like to add to that? Well, I, uh, what I hear there too, aside from what uh, Terrence recommended, which I highly agree with, is that dog sounds like she might be needing some more mental stuff going on too. Like she's going out there with play. Um, one thing I don't do when I'm house training a dog and trying to get a dog to empty on command and thing is when we go out, we empty. And then and you don't necessarily play, just out empty back in the house, uh, do something else. I would maybe then work the dog a little bit, then let them play. 
So uh, it sounds to me like the dog's put together that uh, when I jump on mom and dad, they're going to react. Uh, the excitement's going to get up, which, of course, the dog's getting what it wants. Uh, so it's learned to jump on you to get a reaction. Another thing, too, with a, a, a pup, I don't know how old this one is, uh, that's jumping up. One of the things I don't do is respond in any way, shape, or form. I kind of wait, let them jump up. They quit. They won't burn fuel on stuff that isn't bearing fruit. So they soon learn that the, uh, the jumping up turns the game off instead of going the other way. So, uh, but one thing is, is I don't mix potty breaks with playtime and exploring and chasing birds and things like that. That's awesome. Um, one other thing that I'm going to just add on to this um, for you, Melissa, is that um, your dog is trying to initiate something from you there and hasn't learned how to initiate what they want from you. Um, you need to teach your dog to say please. The best way to do that is to start off using food um, and teaching them that when they want something, they need to offer a sit for attention. I'm not going to go into it right now because I spend 45 minutes talking about it. But um, Dr. Sophia Yin teaches this concept, and it's, um, I believe, especially with a really young pop puppy, one of the most important things you can teach your dog. In fact, uh, maybe on our next call, we'll do a little demonstration of what this should really look like. So we'll just make a note of that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the next question here. We got 15 minutes left with two questions. We'll answer these two. And if we got some time, we'll answer some live questions. How should we train an old puppy to be less aversive to people? Um, so there's a lot of information here to really be able to answer this question. Great. But um, if we've got an older puppy, I'm going to say an older puppy to me is over 16 weeks of age. Um, probably 16 weeks to nine months of age. And it sounds to me like this dog um, is maybe a little concerned about people. Uh, this is from Andrea with Chase. Um, Terrence, uh, do you want to go ahead and start us off? Sure. Um, try to figure out, is it a certain person? Is it everyone? Uh, once you figure that out, then take a step back and have them, have them, he or her, around people, but not in the close environment. And I always go back to offer some obedience, tell them to sit, um, give them a treat, you know, walk away from it, come back to it. The thing is, you don't want to put them right into a situation that they are constantly um, having negative effects from. Change their mindset, uh, make it very positive for them, because when you make it positive for them in that situation or around that person, they're going to start looking at that person as being positive. And good things happen when this person or these people or a <laughs> lot of people are around. Awesome. George. Uh, one, one thing I tend to tell people is to make sure we understand that we can't necessarily make a dog like anything. Uh, where we want to stay focused is making sure they mind their manners. The dog completely has the right to not want to engage with a particular person, so I don't push it. And if you do push it, that's usually where problems arise. However, I do require the dog to be mannerly, so the dog's not allowed to growl or, of course, bite or lunge or things like that. Understand that I believe we're stewards of our dogs, and... Um, I don't like putting them in positions they're uncomfortable with. Of course, I want to work to hopefully make them comfortable with it. But that said, um, a dog bites because he thinks he can or he thinks he has to. And most, most of these nips and things and these aggressive acts for dogs are dogs that have been put in a position where they're uncomfortable and they're trying to make it stop. So I wouldn't try to force the dog to be friendly. You don't have, that's not your place to say so. But you can require them to be mannerly. So you know, that they can sit and be calm around people, lay down and things like that. It's more of a behavioral thing. And there's not a lot of time here to, of course, to go into all that. There's a lot more to it. But just remember, um, keep your dog obedient, and mannerly, and not too much worried about whether or not they like a particular person. And, and Andrew, I'm just going to jump in here because we had a, a similar question on the chat where a dog is not friendly with one particular dog and they're friendly with everything else and i think what terence and george if you want to add to that and george i think you, you said it too you can't force a dog to like another dog 
but what can you do to help them uh, at least get along or, or manage the situation a little bit better? If it's okay, I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and answer this um, because I had a situation like this with one of my own dogs. Um, I had a, um, a dog that was a uh, Belgian Malinois. He um, didn't like uh, boxers in particular. Um, <laughs> just had this one type of dog that he didn't like, but he, he could be around any other dog. But if he saw a boxer, he uh, kind of went into the red zone. Um, and so really, you know, when you have a, a dog that um, doesn't like a particular dog, there may not be anything that you can do. You do have to get very clear about what is it that the dog doesn't like about the other dog? Is it a personality thing or is it a breed thing? Um, some of that can be very difficult to figure out. At the end of the day, um, and what we kind of left out of the, what wasn't in this question that we needed to really be able to answer it better is, you know, an older puppy. Well, if we're dealing with a dog that's over 16 weeks of age, then they're outside of their socialization period. The socialization period between seven and 16 weeks of age is a time period in the dog's life where whatever is happening or not happening is being recorded into their head. So if they never experienced being around long-haired dogs, there's a likelihood that they are going to have issues with long-haired dogs moving forward. Um, so we want to make sure that, A, the dog has been properly socialized. If the dog's not been properly socialized because we adopted an older puppy, well, then so be it. We just have to accept the fact that that dog may not do great with everything. We have to be an ambassador for that dog. We need to do what we can to set them up for success by not putting them into that situation. And then when we are able to put them into that in a controlled environment, then we can do so and try to create a positive association between that dog and the other dog or the other person that that dog may not like. But if the socialization is not being done properly, then this is something that you will likely live with for a lifetime. And although you may be able to improve the behavior of the dog in the situation that it's occurring, the dog is programmed based on its lack of socialization to be this way. And the chances of actually changing that are uh, highly unlikely. Um, George or Terrence, did you want to add anything to that that I might have missed? Uh, I'll, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think the biggest takeaway people should take is you're dealing with behaviors and you're dealing with emotions. The behaviors can be handled. The emotions are not something within our realm to change. Well said. Oh, great answer, George and Andrew. Um, I don't have anything to add. Wonderful. Next and lastly, we have Deborah with Poppy and a few others. I'm hopefully, hopefully picking up a new puppy in the middle of uh, May. Due to the pandemic, puppy classes have been canceled. What can I do to start socializing my new puppy while waiting for classes to resume? Well, uh, Deborah, the first thing you can do is send an email to me. Uh, Andrew at doggyzone.com and I'll send you a list of uh, different things to socialize your dog on. Um, it is a list that is made for a working dog. So I will tell you it is quite exhaustive and it's going to be much more than what you need for your dog, but it'll give you some things to think about. Um, and uh, I'll let Terrence and George go ahead and answer the question, but if you send me that email, we'll, uh, I'll shoot that back to you in the next day or so. Uh, the biggest thing is, is exposure. Uh, take them as many places as you can safely. Uh, teach them how to be on a leash and a collar. Uh, different surfaces, uh, you know, grass, ground, rocks, gravels, uh, lattice, uh, different kind of things. Make loud noises in your house. Bang the pots together, but don't start out bang, bang, bang. Start out bang, 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 bang. bang. You know, you, everything you do, you want to kind of gradually do it. You see that there's something that they're really afraid of, <laughs> step back to introduce them to them, but don't totally avoid it. Excellent. George. Good. Hey, listen, socialization just isn't social activity. It's, it's the dog experiencing the things he's going to come across in his life. So everything uh, Terrence said, and, and then there's so much more. So too often people worry about 
getting the dog, you know, over to a dog park or something. At Dog is Own, we have a daycare. Uh, and I know we keep them, you know, the puppies with, with the smaller dogs and things like that. That'd be a great way to get the dog part of it handled. The rest of it you can do. You can take out, expose that dog to the rain, expose that dog to the sun, uh, grass, concrete, et cetera. The list would go on and on, which you're probably going to send her that list. Um, so socialization isn't just social activity. You want to make sure, and that takes a lot of pressure off of people thinking, oh my God, they're never going to see other dogs, so they're not going to like other dogs. I haven't found that to be true. And there's daycares available like Doggy Zone. Uh, so certainly bring your puppy in for that. Um, and hopefully this thing isn't going to last long. We get those classes fired back up. But remember what socialization is. It's exposing the dog to what it's going to be exposed to early and often. So um, you kind of alluded to this. So I you know, feel like I just should say it. Otherwise, I'm not serving you all here. But um, for those of you that do have, you know, young people, young dogs right now that, you know, you want them to be getting socialized. Um, one of the things that we have at Doggy Zone with our daycare program, and some of you are already utilizing it, is a program called Play Academy. Um, and Play Academy is our, like our most elite level of daycare that we offer. Um, in fact, Shannon um, is on the call right now. She's one of our Play Academy experts and her uh, Jen and myself just recently um, became certified canine fitness trainers uh, through University of Tennessee. And so got some really, really great stuff uh, that we're doing in the Play Academy program. And a lot of it can be around socialization uh, with other dogs, surfaces, sounds, things of that nature. But what I would just tell you is that, you know, at the end of the day, we see a lot of dogs that come to us that have had little to no socialization and at the end of the day, the most important thing that you can do with your dog is teach them to pay attention to you. Um, so all the time that you have right now that you think you'd like to be spending teaching, you know, socializing your dog, take a good portion of that time and start teaching your dog to focus on you, to really watch and look at you. Um, you know, that's something we can teach you how to do in a virtual lesson if you need guidance there. Um, but if you have a dog that can pay attention to you under any level of distraction, then it doesn't matter anymore what your dog is scared of, aggressive towards, or whatever the case may be, because you've got a dog that's learned to respect you and focus on you regardless of what's going on around you. So that is your really best place for you to focus your time right now, because the socialization piece, here's the reality. I'm going to send you a list you're gonna maybe do 30% of what's on the list. And the reality is, is that you're still gonna experience things in your dog's life that they were not socialized to. And without that high level of attention and obedience, the socialization is irrelevant. So that's just kind of what we'll do to uh, finish this last question up here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and kind of put a bow on things here, but um, before we do, I gotta tell everybody here that, you know, obviously um, us doing these phone, uh, phone calls for everybody, um, you know, we do this for your entertainment a little bit. Um, and I say a little bit because we're really not doing this for entertainment purposes. We're really doing this because we want you guys to improve your relationships with your dog. We want you to make progress, right? Like we're not doing this as a social gathering, although we are glad to see all of you. I promise you that. I want you to understand that this is about taking action. This is about doing something different. So I want every single person, if you're on this call right now, if you took the time to sit down and listen to this phone call, I want you to also go ahead and take the time right now to think about what is one thing that I need to start doing with my dog? One thing that I need to start doing, put it into the chat bar. What's one thing that I need to stop doing with my dog? Maybe I, I'm doing something, I realize, you know what? I need to stop giving commands without enforcing them. And then what's one thing that you need to keep doing with your dog? And I'm gonna encourage you, and you, you know, some of you are thinking, Andrew, you might be losing it here, spending too much time in quarantine, but I want you to write your answers into the chat, and then I want you to write them on a piece of paper, and I want you to put it up on your wall somewhere between this week and next week so that you look at it in your mirror every single day of what are the things I'm going to start, stop, and keep doing. Take action with your dogs, folks. You, I mean, you don't have a better time than now. You've got more time on your hands than ever, hopefully. 
Uh, we want to make sure that you're making progress. So um, please uh, continue to post feedback to me. Um, for those of you that didn't get the message last time, uh, my email, andrew at doggyturn.com, is a great place for you all to send feedback. I got great feedback from you all before, some things that we can do to improve. We're going to keep doing this. Um, our goal is to make this a weekly thing. We may even just blow this thing out of the water if we continue to get the traction. Um, so send us your questions. Make sure you're registering. Give us lots of feedback. Um, we really appreciate every single one of you all being on the call here today. I hope everybody stays safe um, and just have a better than great evening. And we'll look forward to seeing you all soon.